So we very rarely have a Monday evening event. I think this might be the first Monday evening event in the history of Kids Comics Unite. But the reason why is because somebody super special is here and she said Monday night was best for her. <laughs> so I was like, whatever you say, we are doing it on Monday night. So I have Ngozi Ukazu here with us, who is one of the most innovative, um, fresh, exciting, amazing comics creators on the scene in the whole world. I, I mean, honestly, this is you, Ngozi, you don't know how excited I am to be here with you because I just admire everything you, that you've done so much. Um, and it brings so much joy. I mean, your work is full of joy. So um, I can barely talk. This happens to me when I get super excited. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little, a little bit of a, a formal introduction, but, you know, then we'll just roll right into questions. Um, and then secondly, you can say whatever you want in the chat anytime the whole time we're talking. I always leave time for questions. So as I'm talking to Ngozi, please be thinking of the questions you want to ask so that when I have exhausted my list of questions and I open it up to the floor that you can ask directly whatever you have on your mind. Um, so Ngozi Ukazu is a best-selling graphic novelist, the creator of Check Please, which started out as a webcomic. And I believe it still has the distinction of being the highest funded Kickstarter comics campaign. Is that right? Second, second highest? Okay, it's now the second highest. For a long time, it was the highest Kickstarter campaign for a comic in Kickstarter's history. So that is pretty awesome. She graduated from Yale University with a degree in computing and the arts, and she's also a cartoonist for The New Yorker. So. Without further ado, Ngozi, what I would love is if you could kind of give us the Cliff Notes version of your career. Like, how did the whole thing get started and kind of take us from your, your origin story to where you are today? Uh, yeah, I can do that. First of all, thank you so much for having me here. I didn't know it would be this many people. Everyone's so fresh faced, even, it's, even though it's on Monday. Well, we're, we're all like cartoonists here. So we all hate Mondays like Garfield. <laughs> um maybe I like I don't know Mondays are I don't know Mondays are that bad we uh, have but, feelings. <laughs> <laughs> but again thank you guys so much for for coming um the clip notes version of my career how I my origin stories to now was that um I'm from Houston Texas born and raised in Houston Texas and I had been drawing my entire life in, in elementary school and middle school I was the comics editor for my school newspaper even but I never thought that I would do comics. I'm first generation, my parents are Nigerian, and I thought I would be, you know, a Nigerian profession, like a pharmacist or a lawyer or an engineer or a doctor. Um, and then my second year at Yale, my sophomore year, I was like, I switched majors from computer science to art at the behest of my really helpful dean. And that was really the start of it. I, I thought I was going to go into animation. I thought I was going to do storyboarding. And then I, after, after Yale, because surprisingly Yale doesn't have a comics degree, weird. Um, I decided to go to SCAD where I could really work on my draftsmanship and start to improve so that I could apply to animation jobs. Uh, in the course of doing that, I started a web comic called Check Please. I started that right after college. And it was only supposed to be like three, like four or five chapters long, maybe like 50 pages. And by the time I hit the fifth chapter, I was like, uh oh, I need to make four volumes of this comic. I worked on it all through grad school. I got to even turn it in for assignments at times. And the readership slowly began to percolate. First, I was begging people on the streets of Tumblr to read my comic. I was just like, please read this. And then eventually people were like, hey, telling others to read it. And eventually people started writing fan fiction for it. And then finally, um, I was able to self-publish and start to do a few Kickstarters. By the time I was doing Kickstarters, that was when um, uh, Gina Gagliano, who was at first second at the time, reached out, was like, hey, I think this is something that we would like in our uh, library. 
And that's when it got published. And I think that's pretty much the end. The first book was published in 2018, and then the second book was published April 2020 during some big world event. <laughs> And, and that's kind of where I am now. I'm working on more stuff, but you know, I I was drawing cartoons on line paper at Beller High School in Houston, Texas. And I still kind of am doing that today, but just a little bit more high scaled. So yeah. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. I forgot. Um, could we zoom in a little bit on some of the key milestones that you talked about like I would really love to hear a little more about um I guess where the idea for the story first came from yeah. and how like do you remember the very first webcomic that you uploaded like how did you feel about it kind mm. of those are both great questions so the impetus for Check, Please was that I wrote a screenplay in my senior year of college about a hockey player. And I am a Black woman from Houston, Texas. None of those things scream hockey. <laughs> but I really just, to, to write the screenplay, I had to do a ton of research and I really just got into it. I, I became like a anthropologist for hockey. I interviewed like every hockey player that I could find um, just in my life and also on the team. I interviewed the beat reporter for our college newspaper whose beat was hockey. And by the time I was done with my screenplay, I was just totally converted, like a crazed hockey fan. Like anytime someone said hockey, I would just like rush them and be like, what do you know? Let's talk. <laughs> and that's and that's really how I started Check Please. So the screenplay that I wrote in, in college was about a gay hockey player who was like this, like really like stoic, like kind of dopey. He's like an enforcer. And it was such a depressing story. It was, it was funny though. But when I, when I started my comic, I was like, this could be the spiritual successor to this, uh, to this story, but let's make it a little bit more light. And usually what people ask me next is like, how did you get this idea to write a hockey screenplay? Good question. Uh, my freshman year at college, I was sitting in my freshman German class and we were talking about how at Yale, there's this thing called like one in four or more talking, referring to how one in four students at Yale are identified as queer in some way. And me and my friend were like, oh, that's cool. And Yale's really progressive. And um, this, we heard across the room, this just like, like, huh, this like, huh, whatever. And it was a guy named Chad. And Chad was on the hockey team. And Chad said, uh, no one on the hockey team's gay. And I was like, that's so weird, Chad. <laughs> why did you have to why did you have to bring that up? That wasn't even in German. And <laughs> yeah, and then he and then I was just like, well, what if? And Chad's a good guy. Um, I, I thank him because checklists would not exist without his random interruption. But yeah, that's how it started. Like I was like, okay, well, what if? What if there was a gay kid on the hockey team? Yeah. And do you, the, the second part of my question was, do you remember like the very first webcomic posting it online and how, like, what were your thoughts were at the time? Yeah. Oh, thank you for reminding me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really wasn't thinking about it. I just, I just posted like the first chapter and I was like, oh, this is kind of fun. This is kind of silly. Like after I graduated, I wasn't really like, I don't know. I guess I, I just was just sharing my art. It was something I could show my friends. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I just I just posted it. And to be honest with you, Check Please is technically not my first web comic. I have an abandoned first web comic, and posting that was like I was I don't know. I had so much ambition for that, and uh, it didn't come to fruition. But it's okay. That's really interesting. I'm so glad you mentioned that because I do you know, in my long career of like, whatever, 20 years of working in this industry, I have seen people pour so much love and energy into projects that ultimately kind of don't go anywhere. But then the next project is the one that really hits, you know, and, you know, it, while you're in the midst of pouring your heart into something that's not going anywhere, it's so difficult. But in a way, it's, it's a, like a rite of passage, I guess. 
Precisely. Uh, I I actually just last week was talking to was doing a Zoom call with RISD students, and my biggest piece of advice to them was like your first projects. The most important thing is just realizing that they're not going to be perfect and taking whatever skills or what you learned from them. Um, you, you don't even have to finish them, but just realize that you know they may not go anywhere, but you can use that for your next project that you that you do. So when you started publishing Check, Please! online, were you doing it uh, just like whenever you had time or did you did you set a regular schedule for yourself or how did that work? The entire seven years that I posted Check, Please! I never had a schedule, <laughs> which was, uh, I don't know, my readers, they were just like, I think some people were like kind of mad, but <laughs> it was it was fine. My excuse was I was in school, but I was only in school for three years. So, so um, wh- where'd you publish it on Tumblr? Yeah, I, I just published it on Tumblr. I, 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 I didn't even think about making a website until maybe three or four years in. Uh-huh. But yeah, I published it on Tumblr. And the great part about that, well, there's like, there's almost, well, I would say there's like two things that really helped. Uh, People always comment on the like slide. If you read it online, it's almost like going through slides. Mm-hmm. People always ask like, how did you come up with that? That's such a neat feature. That was, oh, that was what Tumblr offered. So that's what I had to use. And then the second part was every time people reblogged it, it was kind of like this um, implicit endorsement of my comic. Like people blogged it so that they can have it on their blogs, but they mm-hmm. were also sharing it with all of their followers. So that's how, that's how the comic spread. And it was also really great because if um, a bunch of people we reblogged it on a, on an update day, it would trend a little bit on Tumblr, and people would say like, "What's that?" So it was that was a good place to kind of uh, gain traction. Okay, wow. Well, I I want to ask you a little bit more about um, how you've been so productive, and also about. Uh, social media, because you're known for doing some really interesting things on social media. But before we get to that, you told me that you really love talking about storytelling. So yeah. I would, I'd like to dive into that a little bit first. Yeah. So, um, you know, Check Please has, does indeed have really wonderful dialogue. And when you were describing the research that you did for your screenplay, it made me think of um, almost like you have a very anthropological kind of approach so maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your philosophy of storytelling. Oh yeah, um, I I I used to do, and actually now I still do quite a bit of improv, improv comedy, and you know we all love the show Who's Let In Is Anyway. Those guys are amazing, but the best improv is improv that's really grounded in reality, and that's kind of how I approach my storytelling. Even if it's a fantastical story, even if it's about elves and orcs um that's really how I approach my storytelling um as grounded as possible characters acting at the top of their intelligence not my intelligence or the story's intelligence and when I do research and I think the reason why some of my characters do come off as like authentic or maybe the dialogue is, is good is because when I do research, I am basically just stealing from whom I'm talking to, like lines from an interview might just end up in the story in some way. Uh, yeah, I, I, I believe that there's truth. Oh, <laughs> uh oh, what happened to you? Oh, your cat. <laughs> Oops. Can you hear? Okay. Yes, oh now God. he can hear you again. He he just rubbed the cord and then. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks, Harley. Um, yeah, new cat comic. There you go. That's that's <laughs> drawing from life. So yeah, that's that, that's really. I think that's 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 my biggest philosophy is just there is so much um, universality in the specific kind of like what Bong Joon Ho said at the Oscars about two Mm -hmm. years ago. So anytime I'm writing, I'm, I really look for like a primary source that I can just shove right into my narrative. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, going back to what I mentioned before time, time management, interestingly, Uh, we did a survey this summer 
And the, the number one issue that people in Kids Comics Unite said that they have challenges with is time, like getting their creative work done in between all the other obligations that they have in their life. So do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, I commiserate. I, I have no answers. <laughs> yeah, guys. Ooh, it's, it's, I, I think that's just part of being artists. We never feel like we have enough time to fully breathe life into our, our visions, our, our creativity. It's, yeah, it's, it's time, money, or our, our talent, or time, money, or our, what is it, our skill. We always feel like we're missing something, like, so I don't know. That's, that's what you, my thoughts on it. <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about like what's your average workday like oh. now and maybe talk about how it used to be? Has it changed at all? Uh, has it changed at all? Um, I, I go through seasons. <laughs> I go through seasons. Like there are times when I am waking up early, getting to my drafting table or getting to my desk. I know how many pages I want to knock out that day on like on a work day. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I try to work, work four or five days a week. Unfortunately, sometimes I might work six or seven. Mm -hmm. uh, I do, or sometimes I only get like three honest days of work done. Mm -hmm. But I would say, uh, I'd say like 20% of my time goes into the admin of answering emails, uh, just doing file management, organizing, making sure my studio is in order. And then let's say like 70% is actually drawing or writing a script, thumbnailing, inking, what have you. And then like 10% is the other stuff in my professional practice, which is talking to students, going to conventions, just meeting up with uh, my friends and, and colleagues. Mm -hmm. And an average workday is, it, it really does vary, but I try to get a good amount of work done before lunch. And then I don't know, there's like a, a certain number of hours that goes by. <laughs> uh -huh. And then I try to get a little bit work, uh, worked up before dinner. And then dep depending if I feel good or not, I'll stop working after dinner or mm -hmm. I'll keep working into the night. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like, um, I don't know, like didn't Ursula K. Le Guin like publish her work day? Am I, am I making that oh, up? really? Oh, I don't know yeah. that. That's interesting. It was like very short and very funny. Oh, okay. Well, we're definitely going to look that up. <laughs> I see that there are people asking questions already. Um, Michael said, since you have experienced script writing, do you carry that into the web comics and graphic novels or do you start with the art? That's an interesting question. That's a good question. I, I start with the script and by the time I'm thumbnailing, uh, the art starts to inform the script. So the two mix together. Um, and for the first time ever, I, oh, it's, oh sorry, it's a dog barking. But for the first time ever, I've had to like work in different methods. So I, I'm working on a book with DC Comics and for them, they had to have the entire script written and completed before I can move on to thumbnails. And that's not usually what I do. Usually I work on a work on an outline. I might thumbnail while I'm scripting and work through each chapter. And then I also, uh, we just finished this project, which should be coming out next year. I worked on a book with my friend, Madeline Rupert, where I was only doing the writing and she was doing the penciling and inking. And that was the first time that I'd ever written a script for someone else. And I'm sorry, I'm going to just say it. Writing is is easy and it's easier in comparison to art. Art is a lot harder. And any writer who thinks that like, who does not think they're artist is bad. <laughs> <laughs> because it was just, it, I like, I breezed through the script. I didn't breeze through the script. It was, it was difficult, but I finished writing the script and I had to do so many revisions to make that script something that like my friend, the artist Madeline could work with. And she did so much heavy lifting and completing the translation of like just text and script into the final comic. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. And then I, I have another, pro and then I, I, I'm doing another graphic novel. These, these are all, they aren't all happening like concurrently. It sounds mm -hmm. crazy, but I'm doing another graphic novel where it was, it felt probably the most like check please where 
I did revisions while I was drawing it. Yeah. So yeah, I sometimes start with the art, sometimes start with the art, but mostly I'm starting with the, with the with some outline. So one of the things you just talked about is collaboration, and um, that was something else I wanted to ask you about because, well, I know I know your agent Chelsea a little bit, um, and I believe you work with George Rohack too, right? Yeah. Yeah. So George, I've known for a while as well. Um, so, and then you just mentioned, you know, Madeline that you're working with at the moment. How do you find people that you feel like are you feel confident to partner with in different aspects of what you do? Ah, oh, that's a great question. Well, how do I find people? I was lucky because Chelsea walked up to me. <laughs> I was sitting in New York Comic Con in 2019, and Chelsea just comes up and says hi. And then, like three months later, she became my agent. <laughs> so that was that was really lucky. Um, but I, I, I guess there was, I guess there was a little bit of like, I had to talk to her, get to know her, like what, what mm -hmm. are the criteria for people that I want to be part of my team and I want to collaborate? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's people who genuinely get that this is about the storytelling, this is about the art at mm -hmm. the end of the day. Uh, you know, if we all wanted to be making like $300,000 a year, we could just be programmers you can go into tech but we're comic artists we're cartoonists we're writers and I find that when I want to collaborate with someone it's because they really understand that I, I don't know how to say it there's there's nothing there's nothing past the art like yeah that might come with accolades and yeah we might make some money on the mm -hmm. way but we just want to we just want to tell a good story. With Madeline, we just wanted to tell a very dumb story. Like dumb, <laughs> dumb as a compliment. I <laughs> like things dumb, like SpongeBob. We just wanted to make sure it was funny. We wanted to make sure that it was real. And she is one of the most effortlessly talented artists that I know. So I was just thankful that I got to take up a bit of her creative real estate in mm -hmm. doing the comic. Yeah. It's it's vibes. Yeah, you know what the kids are saying these days, vibes. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about what you do with George Rohack? Because um, he's kind of almost like a business manager, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, George is my business manager. And what George manages, uh, he does, my, he basically runs my online store and then he manages all of my Kickstarter projects. So mm -hmm. for my online store, it was him who like, he found DFTBA for us um, and the other people that he manages he is really on top of make like asking us if he wanted to develop any merchandise, you know, mm -hmm. make a t-shirt or like an enamel pin mm -hmm. and just making sure that the inventory is, is there like, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, something that he tackled this summer was dealing with, like, we had a lot of inventory that couldn't be in the DFTBA warehouse. The mm -hmm. DFTBAs don't forget to be awesome. That's their, mm -hmm. that's the online store. And he had to figure out a place in Missoula, Montana, where we could put our inventory. So he went up there and like drove around. So it's, it's, it's stuff like that. And I'm really thankful that, uh, he provides that service. And I met him originally while I was doing my very first Kickstarter, which I fulfilled by myself somehow. I was so stressed, man, don't get me started. I'll tell you guys about that Kickstarter. That Kickstarter stressed me out. <laughs> um, but George is fantastic because I talked to him on the phone for like one hour and then I called him again for half an hour and I was just like, oh, wait, so you're saying I should order maybe 10% more of my like book inventory than the number of backers I actually pledged. And he was like, yeah, because you're going to lose books in the mail. And I was like, what? <laughs> um, he was so helpful. And I was like, oh, do I have to pay you for this information? He was like, until I write an email, all of this is pro bono. So don't worry about it. Um, yeah. And so to kind of get to the second part of what he does is like that help that he gave me in the Kickstarter, my first Kickstarter is what he does for me now, which is the like spinning plate Rube Goldberg machine that is fulfilling a Kickstarter. I've had to do it once and it's hard. And even just kind of sitting on the sidelines, it still is so difficult, but George loves uh, chaos. So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's like a logistics, yeah, maestro kind of guy. Yeah, I think <laughs> when he sees 
it's like a ball of like earphone wires. He's the guy who's like, yeah, I'm gonna. I love pulling off earphones. <laughs> That's you know, a good. You know that popular phrase. <laughs> So um, another thing that I mentioned is your social media prowess. So the the thing that you did that I think people talk about, which is so cool, is creating a Twitter account for your main character. And did you just create a Twitter account for Biddy or were there other characters that also had Twitter accounts? So I created a Twitter account just for Biddy. And I actually wrote my graduate thesis on that. It was multi-platform storytelling in online Mm. comics. Um, And it's something that I kind of desperately want to do again, even though it depleted my energy. (laughs) I went a little crazy because I was tweeting. So if you you guys don't know, um, my main character, he's this college kid, uh, Eric Biddle, and he's a vlogger. But he also ran a Twitter account from like 2015 to 2017 that updated to my best attempts in real time with the comic. So if you were following Biddy on Twitter, he would just be like, good morning, y'all. I just had breakfast. But that was me in bed, like blurry eyed being like, Biddy needs to eat. (laughs) Like you look at Tamagotchi, if he didn't eat or if he didn't do something, people would be like, Biddy, are you okay? Oh God, I went (laughs) crazy. That was It was like one of the most fun things to do because it was storytelling in a really interactive way. And I got to understand his like voice better, but I, I, I went crazy. (laughs) Oh my God. It was, it was fun. It was fun. Yeah. I can, I can see how it would be super fun and super exhausting all at the same time. So you had to react to like global events, which was like, I don't like what happened. Like, 2016, like the presidential election, I was like, what is Biddy? I don't want Biddy to talk about the debates. So that was that was really fun. Wow. Wow. That's all I can say. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so um I am I'm gonna open it up for questions really soon. So you guys th- be thinking about all that stuff. Um well, wait a minute. I had a question I wanted to ask you. Oh, yes, yes, a question about that's actually relevant to everybody here in this room. So if you had to start all over now, or like, so my question is, how would you do things if you had to start over, like starting right now? Or what's your advice to people who are in the shoes that you were in, you know, back, you know, whatever, seven years ago or 10 years ago, people who are just building, starting to build their career? Um, if I were starting over, would I be writing check please? Probably a different story, but I would, there's, and I, and I was talking to those RISD kids last week. I was, so one of them asked me, where should I be posting my work? And I just turned around and just said like, I don't know where are Gen Z people posting their work? I think maybe I'd be on TikTok sharing my art and how I'm making it. I'd be really trying to network kind of post pandemic with people who are making comics, going to smaller shows, but I don't know. I, I, I would be doing, I think, I honestly don't think I'd be changing that much other than like where I was posting Mm -hmm. because uh, for me, it's just about getting as much of the story out as possible. So I would still be drawing, um, just crazy little like side drawings that, no, that aren't in the comic. I'd still be writing in the voice of my characters. Um, yeah, maybe I would have an Instagram for one of my characters mm-hmm. and like do drawings or updates of their day and stuff. So yeah, it, it'd be, actually, I kind of really want to do that, but it, so <laughs> yeah, it'd be something, something similar, but just different platforms. Do you think you'll go back to self-publishing at all in any way? Uh, I. I mean, yes, don't tell Chelsea, but I am working on little things <laughs> that really should not be published. They're like just dumb stories. Chelsea's in the chat. So I, I'm telling you not to tell <laughs> Chelsea's just there. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Chelsea. Yeah, I, I think if I do self-publish, it's kind of maybe smaller stories that mm-hmm. uh, are really, really like not 
marketable. Mm-hmm. I'm like, I could hear Chelsea like laughing at me. She's like, how do we know we're not, they're not marketable? <laughs> um, but I, there's something about the immediacy and intimacy of self-publishing that nothing matches. Just mm. like, like stuffing a zine into a mailer that you got off eBay and sending it to, I don't know, Canada. Mm-hmm. Like there's something about that connection and just having someone like immediately get your vision. I don't know. There, there's something really cool about that. I love, I love it. So at some point I probably will. Do yeah. you have a Patreon or any way that you stay connected with your, your super fans? <laughs> yeah, I have a Patreon. And the funny thing is that Patreon, I started it in 2015 and it's changed so much over time. It was at its peak when I was updating maybe like twice a month. And when I update, I do like 10 pages at a time. And that was, I had an ongoing comic. And now it's, you know, it's a lot more quiet because I'm working on so many other things that I'm not, you know, that aren't serialized. Mm-hmm. And the, but when it was in its heyday, the connection I had with the readers was just, you know, I was kind of in this fandom with them. I was like, I want to talk about these characters all the time. I'm tweeting mm-hmm. as one of the characters. So let's just talk about the characters all the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That cool. makes total sense to me. That's the way I feel about Kids Comics Unite. Yeah. <laughs> I can talk to anybody about it. Like, let me tell you about what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, I would like to open it up to questions. So I see, well, I just right off the bat, Bob, you have a question. You want to unmute yourself? Yes, uh, I had a very simple question. We'll start off with something simple. <laughs> um, I'm trying to build a fan base and uh, I just feel like TikTok is not my jam, but maybe I should go there. But I'm I'm going the newsletter route. Have you ever gone the newsletter route to build fans? Um, yeah, with my Patreon, I do have like a monthly newsletter where, where I say, this is what I'm working on this month and then give a little sneak preview. But to turn this around and ask you a question, why is TikTok not for you? Uh, I've just, uh, I've just never done it. I just <laughs> haven't started you it. You'd be surprised. Jump in there. <laughs> no, I'm serious. You'd be surprised. Um, do you know about, do you know about uh, Babs on TikTok? She's everyone's mom on TikTok. Someone's heard of her. I know. I, yeah, I don't even use TikTok. That's that's bad. I got to start TikTok, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. That's my, that's my takeaway. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I mean, I like whatever's hot is whatever's hot, right? And I, you'd be surprised like who's using TikTok. I follow so many people from all walks of life who are using TikTok, people from all over the world and places you would you never like imagine. And yeah. So I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I'm not even using TikTok that much. So I don't know why I'm getting on you for that, but. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Ryan. Oh, we can't hear you, Ryan. I don't know why. How about now? Yes, now we can. Yay. <laughs> hey, Ngozi, thank you so much for coming in and chatting with us. This is a really incredible. Um, I, as a professor, was sort of honing in on your advice to young creators, where you were talking about how first projects aren't necessarily important to finish but really it's more about the acquired skills you get and that you can move on to your next project with. So I was curious what that first abandoned web comic taught you that you used in Check Please. And then if you have any time, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that abandoned web comic. Yeah, okay. So actually when I was doing this presentation for the students of RISD and also the students of the VBOG animation uh, school, in Vboard Denmark, my my actual piece of information, like takeaway, was it's important to learn how to finish projects. Which is a little contradictory because I didn't finish my first project, but knowing how to finish a chapter or knowing how to finish, you, you know, a anthology submission that is important. And the biggest takeaway from that is to learn how you feel throughout the process for, throughout the process of starting to completion. 
And I shared with them this little graph that I share a lot. We'll just have, we'll just visualize here because we're talking in real life to each other, um, which was a graph that I made after a few chapters of making checklists where I, uh, I charted how I felt from scripts to thumbnails, to pencils, to inks. And my ego, my sense of self, my security went up and down like drastically. And I still use that chart to this day so that I know that, okay, I'm, I'm in pencils. I'm going to feel a little like stressed out. Um, but from that first webcomic, I actually learned quite a bit about like promoting, promoting a story or promoting a project, telling people about it. I also kind of was able to temper my ambitions a little bit because I had huge ambitions for this webcomic. And when I started Check Please, I started so small and I kept the story really, really small um, to... And, and I think that's why I ended up going a lot further. And that love comic, since you asked, was called The Closet Story. And The Closet Story was a story about a law school dropout who opened a cafe. And in the basement of the cafe was a closet. And if you put a book into the closet and close the door and open the door, the author of the book would be standing there at the age they were when they finished the book. And they put a collection of Oscar Wilde poems in the closet and he comes out the closet, but for whatever reason, they can't send him back. It was a sitcom. <laughs> uh, yeah, and uh, one of my friends uh, who, is, who is a genius, he would write Oscar Wilde's voice, but yeah, that's, yeah. He was actually a poet, so yeah. <laughs> that's the story. Is, th is that emotional graph available anywhere? That's, that's brilliant, by yeah, the way. Yeah. I feel like I wanna do that now. <laughs> emotional graph. So this is the emotional graph. Um, it's how I feel about each episode of Check Please over time. And it goes from feeling brilliant to feeling like boo-boo to, you know, to, to, this is the worst one to, you know, maybe I'm being hard on myself. No, nope, this is definitely the worst one. And I <laughs> literally felt that I, my, I would lose all my readership every time I posted, but it always evened out. Eventually it just evened out to being okay <laughs> over time. Anyway, so that's the graph. It looks like you're super not into coloring. Is that because you don't like the process or because you feel like somebody else colors better than you? I actually love coloring. Huh. <laughs> I, teach a, I teach a class. I used to teach a workshop on coloring at the Center for Cartoon Studies. But when I was laying down flats, so that line actually kind of stops in the middle of coloring. When I would do flats, that's when I was like, oh boy, I am the worst at this and this comic is bad. But as soon as I started adding that color and light by James Gurney, um, that's when things started to sparkle a little bit more. Awesome. Thank you. Right. Do we have any other questions? Bonnie, you just posted a question. Can you unmute yourself? Do you wanna? I was just trying to nibble. <laughs> blow my nose and you know <laughs> human thing um i i was wondering how your audience has changed since you were traditionally published and um and do you communicate communicate with your graphic novel readers differently than your web comics readers mm -hmm. Well, those questions are related because I think I communicate with those two audiences differently because they're made up of two different people, di different types mm -hmm. of people. I think mm -hmm. my traditional, uh, so when I, when I started publishing traditionally, that was when I started meeting students who may not be like as online. They were just people mm -hmm. who were like, I found this in my school library. I found this, you know, at the bookstore. Right. And they are, are people who are more like maybe prose readers who got picked up mm -hmm. the book because it was recommended to them. And, you know, they were, they were really, really fun. And when I, when I interact with them, it's mostly just like on Twitter, I'll tweet something or maybe they'll reply to something on Instagram mm -hmm. with the audience that kind of built up check, please. Those are the true freaks. And I love them. Uh, <laughs> they're the people who were just on Tumblr. <laughs> And we're like, what the heck is this weird comic? And they just went into it. And I think mm. Tumblr readers, the people who read it online were truly the people who were just like, just ready to write fan fiction, ready to make fan art, ready to make memes. 
And when I communicate mm-hmm. with those guys, we all have the same type of like jaded millennial Gen Z meme. Like you can have mm-hmm. a conversation with just SpongeBob quotes and it's a little bit more chaotic. But when I meet those people in person at conventions, we kind of go back to like the, mm-hmm. oh yes, we, we're normal people. And this book is in bookstores. Let's behave like adults. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I kind of get that through my son. Like he doesn't do exactly web comics, but he does, you know, niche, yeah. you know, um, games and things. Yeah. But it feels so pressured. Is it not like pressured to have to deliver um, <laughs> in order to keep that going? Like it's so yeah. easy for me to write in Facebook about all kinds of things that I think about, but to actually then put the story in and the character. And also if you're trying to get traditionally published, how do you know how much to put out and how much not to put out? Like before they go, oh, it's already published. We don't want it. I think. Well, yeah, that's <laughs> right. something. So, okay. I actually, so to enter the first part, which is the pressure, that pressure, I don't think it's gone away. It's kind of mutated. Like I'm working on my next graphic novel and the pressure is just like, who's going to read this? Um, I mean, people are going to read it. And I think a lot of people will like mm. it, but it's just like, okay, so I've spent a few years digging out my heart and being vulnerable mm-hmm. and making these characters and telling this story. And the pressure is like, I hope it delivers. I hope people like mm-hmm. it. I hope critics right. read it. Like, I hope critics give it stars. Who knows? And when I was making Check mm-hmm. Please, the pressure was just like, I hope people think this is funny. I hope people <laughs> like, hope the ki- like agree with this character mm-hmm. choice. It was, it, it got stressful. Never do a serialized comic. Slash <laughs> do a serialized comic because it makes you feel alive. I think they're really exciting. Mm-hmm. Um, but the other part, which is posting, how much do you post online? Mm-hmm. I am maybe this is not a good piece of advice, <laughs> but I <laughs> have a hard time not sharing everything. So mm-hmm. part of the checklist deal that I made that we made is this is actually all George Rohab was that we could keep the entire comic online, even though we were mm-hmm. publishing it traditionally, with the idea mm-hmm. that in this theory, which it's hard to prove, but I think it's true, that it would not affect sales because it's totally different audiences. It's worked out for me, I can say that the least. But when it comes to telling stories, like, I don't know, I'm always about, it's about the story and the people reading it. And if a publisher gets you know, like, uh, like like a little prissy about so much of it being outlined, of it being online or out there. I'm like, ah, okay, okay, move on. <laughs> You're slowing me down. Well, uh, maybe that's a little. I'm not sure if that's great advice. I'm just a little. Actually, I I love this topic. I and I I feel that publishers are wrong most of the time when they think that stuff that's online should be taken down once it's traditionally published. I mean. Flat out wrong. I think they're wrong. <laughs> I think that they're they're t- completely different audiences. And even if they are, if they do overlap, I think the people who are really big fans of online stuff will buy it anyway because they're fans of it and they want everything involved with it. Yeah, I agree. I, I it has not hurt me. I'm, I'm not hurting. So yeah. yeah, I I really wish that there that this would change that. Um, and I think it will actually, I do think it will change. I think that's just the way culture and society is going. And I don't think you can stop it. It's like a river. <laughs> All right. Who else has a question for Ngozi? Um, Michael. I have a question. Oh, oh go, go ahead. Hi, Ngozi. I was just wondering, um, was there any scenes or moments that were removed from the traditional published ver- version compared to your webcomic? And if there were, um, how did you feel about it or how, you know, how did it affect the final uh, published format? So there actually weren't any removed scenes. Um, everything was pretty much kept intact, which I was really grateful for my editor, uh, Kiara Valdez, uh, was, you know, very, very upfront with just, you know, taking the story as is, 
you know, there were some changes to maybe like, I don't know, fixing typos or stuff like that, but the story is pretty much like a one for one translation. Yeah. And I, I, to kind of answer your second question, even though um, there wasn't anything taken away from the uh, original comic in its adaptation to a traditional uh, book, I'm okay with editing. We needed editing. <laughs> I always need editing. So it's, 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 it's nothing wrong if, if an editor steps in and says like, hey, maybe we should take this out. Maybe you can add that in. So with your current project that you're working on, it sounds like it's a very traditional kind of book deal where you are you have an editor and you're working together with the editor to shape the project, but you're not, are you sharing it at all online or are you not sharing it? I've shared like maybe two or three pages. It's 300 pages somehow. I don't know how that happened. Um, and yeah, so I've shared a little bit of it online, but it's, it's pretty traditional, like turning in an outline, turning in thumbnails, uh, yeah, turning in pencils, very, very methodical. Do you feel um, any sense of, I don't know how to put it, I feel like loss is too strong of a word, but like, I, I just really love what you said about sharing your work with readers and having, having that interactivity and the energy of people responding mm -hmm. as you're working on something. So do you feel that absence in the process of this current project or is or because you have an editor it's like that that fills in for the reader the online readership that is an excellent question there are pros and cons to doing a serialized work versus the more traditional method of having an editor come through and doing multiple revisions over the whole arc of the story and i think it's trading that intimacy and that immediacy for precision <laughs> And I think the precision that I gained from, you know, having an editor say like, hey, think about this, having Chelsea give me feedback on like, maybe you can tweak this scene a little bit. Like, yeah, I'm not, I'm never going to have readers, you know, tweeting at me saying like, oh my God, this scene happened. But I do have just a little bit more precision to the themes of the story, to the, to what the character's choices are. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, the difference between improv and acting, I guess. Improv yeah, yeah, that makes work. a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, Maritza. Hi. Um, okay, I had a question. You'd mentioned um, that with DC Comics that they had you do the script um, and you're new, used to doing the thumbnails and having that kind of, um, you know, have your story evolve with that and I've just learned so much about the thumbnails being really integral so what do you think were the positives and negatives of that and would you do it again or would you try and negotiate back and say let me do the thumbnails and like change that process so this was also a different process for me because I actually commissioned someone to help me do the layouts do the thumbnails it was one of my former students from SCAD, who was a, such a like talented artist for action and motion. So I reached out to them and I was like, I have this finished script. Um, and I'm also silly and I'm working on like two other projects. Can you help me with the layouts and thumbnails for this? And I would give them feedback on the layouts. And it's kind of how like Mangaka work. They like, it's kind of like they break down the steps. And I was like, well, if mangaka are doing that. And I really, I actually really liked it because with this story, it's, uh, I, I mean, I could talk about this story for a while. Uh, it's, it's like a Jack Kirby uh, character and the outline in the story itself like was kind of set in stone. I, I did a few tweaks to it. But there wasn't really a lot of discovery going on in the like scenes. Like when I was writing check please and I would thumbnail each chapter as kind of as I went, write a script, thumbnail it, finish drawing it, post, write another script, thumbnail it. Like there was discovery that happened in the scenes and that was really exciting. But for this project, I was like, these characters are a little bit set in stone. I can have them have like really cool, interesting reactions and do kind of fun setups and see the execution. But it was, I figured most of that out in the script. So 
yeah, it was, it was also surprisingly like painless. Every time I turned something in, I was expecting like big, bad DC editor to just be like, I'm Batman and just like say just like say like this is not (laughs) gonna work but they were so encouraging uh Jim Chadwick at DC really great so yeah okay cool thanks that sounded intimidating so it's good to hear more about that I was I was intimidated but they've been Mm -hmm. knock on wood they've been really good to to me so far great cool thanks Okay, I got a question from um, Gashwain Hud, who said that he's in a noisy situation. So um, he wanted me to read his question. So the question is, um, if you are starting out as an independent creator who has an online comic, what would be your advice about who should be the first person on your team to help you grow, such as an agent, a manager, an editor, et cetera? Um, that is a really good question. If I was making a choice, uh, honestly, it would be whom, like, it would be whoever is out there who wants to see you grow. It's not so much of an active choice of like hiring someone or like choosing a collaborator saying, let's collaborate. Uh, you might even test the waters with a few people. I think if you're looking for your team, I, like, and, I, and I inadvertently did that with George. Um, I reached out for advice and he gave me so much great advice. Like he was always there to answer questions. And then he said like, you know, I offer these services if you ever need them. And then I made that choice of like, hey, let's let's collaborate. I think if I was a web comic artist or just a comic artist starting out, it depends on how you want to go. If you want to go the self-publishing route, you might, you know, really look for someone who could help you with choosing a vendor, going to conventions, um, like maybe the business side. But if you're going the traditional route, it's about finding an agent or some advocate for you who really understands your story and understands your goals. So lots of talking with people and asking them, do you understand me? Do you get me? It's a vibe sort of thing, I think. It's a rapport. Like you just, you meet people and then you feel like they really understand me. <laughs> so I don't know. Do we have any last question? I, I have a qu- one last question I would love to ask you, Ngozi, but I want to first at see if there's anybody else here who has a question for you. Bob, you have one last question or were you just? Oh, no, no. I said you can go. But oh, I can go. I did okay. want oh, to Mike, say Mike. that <laughs> the book that she mentioned, Color and Light, is oh, a great yeah. book. I feel like we've actually talked about that before, that book. Uh, oh, look, there it is. <laughs> yeah. All right, Maybe Michael. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, I've got a bunch of questions, but I'll just ask one right now because you, 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 you kind of touched on that you've got all these people who are kind of collaborating in your career. I'm kind of curious from the business point of view, did you incorporate, did your agent help you do that? How how is the business aspect working for you? How do you manage that? That's a great question. Um, I formed an LLC in like, what is it, 2017 or so. And I honestly don't know why someone just told me to. I think to, you know, so they wouldn't take my house or something. Um, The business aspect of all of this, I think it's, to to be very practical about it, it's asking a lot of questions to uh, like my business manager, who is kind of a wizard when it comes to just knowing like, oh yeah, so this is how you, this is maybe how you should approach taxes. Or I also have a, a CPA accountant who I ask a lot about just, um, hey, my finances, like what should I do for quarterly uh, quarterly taxes? And it's a lot of just organization. I, I, love a, I love a planner, I love a calendar. So when it comes to business, I guess business is making money and promoting yourself. Um, I, I ask a lot of questions and just take my time. It, just, it doesn't happen all at once is the biggest thing I've noticed when it comes to like everything that I've developed in the business side of my, I guess, my work. 
it's just a lot of slow connections and asking people questions and like every year a little bit grows. All right, so um, Ngozi, my last question for you is, it's actually it's sort of a two-part question. Um, so the first part of the question is, who or what inspires you? Like what gets you like just incredibly jazzed up and excited? Oh. Um, and then the second part of the question is, what are you excited about? What do you see on the horizon, either for yourself or for the industry as a whole or for culture, like whatever, you can answer it in any way you want. That's a great question. Um, I'll talk about what I get, ex what I'm excited about, and then I'll talk about what gets me jazzed. Mm -hmm. um, I, for I guess for myself, I am excited for all these projects to come out eventually. I am really excited for my project with Madeline Rupert because it's the culmination a little bit of not just of our friendship, but of our kind of like just creative, like I don't know, creative relationship as people who met in grad school who like respected each other's work, seeing that actually come to fruition is like just so cool. I always, I don't know, I always talk about it as like, you know, like, like I'm, <laughs> I'm the dad, she's the mom, uh, she grew the baby. Because <laughs> that's what the artists do, they grow the baby. <laughs> uh -huh. All I have to do is like, make sure this baby goes to a good pop. <laughs> how I don't have kids as you could probably tell anyway but I'm really excited for that project I'm really excited for that project um and I'm excited for, oh and that project it's called bunt and it's the story of art students who have to win one game of softball in order to get athletic scholarships and graduate without student loans it's a cautionary tale about financial aid but it's also a lovely tale about the joys of art school so it's really fun that was really fun to make um what gets me jazz see I can be a, a crazy person when I talk about certain things that get me worked up um but I can talk about I mentioned this on like another podcast that I did this is for all the uh the dads and uncles not to be sexist I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Patrick O'Brien's uh Mm -hmm. naval history mm -hmm. books mm -hmm. that the master and commander film was based off of that book I started reading them in 2018 and I've taken a break from them just because I don't want to finish them uh these books got me so hyped in 2018 I was reading them during my book tour which is just like you know I I I go to a signing and I talk about like my cute gay love story and then I'd go home and read about you know the Dutch ship, the Vauxham Heights, trailing the 50th latitude. I don't know. It's really weird. Uh, the this book has uh, this book series has everything I love, which is just unabashed indulgence in like niche details. Just Patrick O'Brien was a professor at the University of London, and then it also has just more humor than you can shake a stick at. Yes, you have to wade through about 30 pages of uh, boat terminology in order to get to the humor but I did it it's really fun <laughs> I, this is a, that's like on a scale of like one to ten I'm at a three if I were at a ten talking about this book people would start like logging off they'd be like <laughs> <laughs> well you know what lately I've been really into Ngozi I've been into um the Netflix show about Formula One um Drive to Survive <laughs> And I was having drinks with somebody recent. I was like, oh my God, that show. I love that show. And he's like, you? <laughs> Formula One? <laughs> but I'm obsessed. I just love it so much. <laughs> I, I haven't seen that show, but Formula One fandom on Tumblr is huge right now. Yeah. Anyway, well... So everybody, this was really, really fun. And Gozi, I, I hope that someday I get to meet you at a con and, you know, have a drink or something like that. I hope all of us get the chance to meet you. This was really, really, really great. Really appreciate it. I feel like I could fangirl a little bit. I did already, but woohoo. If every oh, so what I would really like is for everybody to turn uh turn off your mute, turn on your microphone so we can all say thank you and good night and
go off into our evenings. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.